the story of how sadguru supposedly hit a certain important point in his own spiritual evolution mm-hmm. and it's not something that only he has spoken about if you actually study uh the sages across indian history they all speak about this one point where the boundaries between the inner world and the external world seem to have diminished hmm. sure in terms of sadguru said that i was sitting there i was meditating under the tree on chamundi hill i think and he says that at one point something happened where everything around me and everything within me was the same so this is um this is logical and this is a part of something called as ego disillusion yes this is what i'm talking about from a perspective of evolution yeah so let me come back to the parietal lobe thing sure. because as you said the part of your brain your brain is aware of where your body ends right this is called personal space your brain always needs to know where your personal space ends then you have peripersonal space which is the area which is right around my body and then there is extra personal space which is beyond that why is this important because the closer somebody is the more importance your brain will give that person in terms of both love and fear so your brain has to judge distance so if somebody is threatening you and they are a kilometer away your brain is more relaxed but they are right in your face full alarm bells ringing right like amygdala is very active because it depends on the personal on the distance of space now very interestingly when does your personal space change it can change when you are holding something that you identify as yourself so a good example is somebody who has learned sword fighting for a long time will consider the sword as an extension of their arm so in their brain they know exactly where the sword's tip ends because their brain has added this calculation that this sword is now part of my arm and so when they will move they know where the sword is or a batsman or a batsman or a tennis player they know exactly where the where their body ends and where the bat begins and where the bat ends so it is part of their body now so i highlight this to tell you that the personal space definition is not fixed it is fluid a very interesting side angle to this is when you are in love that other person is now a part of you you're speaking from a scientific perspective yes so when you love someone deeply love someone when you see that other person getting hurt you will feel that hurt because your body inter- your brain interprets their body as your own and this is deep love so a mother to a child for example right and when that child falls down the mom will react as if she has gotten hurt because the your brain interprets it that way and that can happen in romantic love as well especially when you are intimate when you are canoodling or whatever cuddling or whatever when you are in that same space your brain can build a sense of intimacy that brings you to so close that you are one which is a you can say that's a almost a spiritual experience to feel your own personal space expand to involve a whole other person which is why breakups can hurt like right? if you're very close to somebody and you've gone your brain can almost feel like a part of your body is gone away and part of recovering from a breakup is re-identifying your personal space now what sadguru claims to have experienced is ego disillusion which is ego is what holds your personal space in place ki this is me this is not me self non self this difference is ego suppose if my ego dissolves hypothetically suppose if my ego dissolves now where is the i and like i said love can dissolve that ego but love for one person what if hypothetically 
I build love for everyone. Genuine love for the world, for existence, for life. And I am the world. Hypothetically, that would mean that my brain has now expanded enough that my personal space is now the world. From a neuroscience perspective, what would change in the structure of the brain? If you, look, if you do an MRI, nothing. The brain would still look the same. We are talking of networks. The neural pathways would change. I don't really know what that would look like, but I'm talking theoretically, this is possible. So if you've lost your sense of self and you've, if you've dissolved yourself, your sense of personal space could theoretically include the whole world. In your eyes as a neuroscientist, is that a valid next stage of evolution or are we romanticizing spiritual talk here? I don't think we are romanticizing it, but practically speaking, I wouldn't expect this to happen for everybody. And there is a reason for it, um, which is that ego plays a very useful role in our lives. So we tend to villainize ego a lot. We tend to say that, no, no, we should not have ego. But it is ego that makes you get up and go to work. Mm, mm. It's ego that makes you progress want to in your career, progress in your career, protect your family. If you say that everybody is the same, it doesn't matter who lives or dies. Sabka, sablok, we are all living the same story at, at that level. Uh, it might be actively harmful for us. So I'm not convinced that this is the stage. This is the journey for everybody. But which is why in Indian scriptures, it is written that um, reaching that stage of ego dissolution too early in your life is also not a great idea because you still have to go through those four stages. And um, in the middle stage, the artha, kama, moksha. So you have to go through, um, you have to go through materialism. You have to go through kama, which is desire. Then you have to go through detachment and then nirvana because that is the path. And that's, I feel that's a practical thing to do. Perhaps in this final chapter, I'd like to ask you a hypothetical question, which is that if I put someone in front of you who is supposedly actually evolved, who's gone beyond the point of nirvana, moksha, as a neuroscientist, what would you ask him or her? The first question that I've always been curious about is why are you still talking to everybody. <laughs> I've, I'm genuinely curious about it. Because if I am an enlightened person, I have no ego. There is no Siddharth. And I'm sitting on stage and I'm talking to people. Somebody insults me. Somebody makes fun of me. There is no me. Somebody asked me a question, but there is no me. Where does my motivation come from to answer or convince somebody or get into a debate with somebody? Because that person is also me. The audience is also me. The questioner is also me. So, why am I here? Would you ask that person anything that would further your own research and understanding of the brain? So after they answer this question, that will hopefully calm my deep cynicism. Um, because I, I, I believe that a spiritual journey will eventually end with you coming to terms with everything. And I feel like that would also settle that core desire in you to tell people things. Because you will realize that sabka apna apna journey hai. And I think that is a very rare person who will achieve nirvana and still come and talk to everybody. I think it is a very rare person who would truly achieve nirvana which is let go of their ego to that extent where nothing really matters. Money doesn't matter. People don't matter. Uh, 
and still be involved in running a business or creating a brand or trying to answer questions i think that would be a very rare person and if so the world will be very lucky to have that um but if such a person does exist then and if they are willing then i would absolutely want to put them in a functional mri and ask them to just talk about their experience just talk about how do you see life and just see how their amygdala is not getting activated at all how they are how they are are they focusing outside or inside is there an outside or inside anymore if there is no ego then what are they what is their brain focusing on because this outside inside is a very ego perspective what inside after that i am very curious i would want to do that because people have done functional mris on um long term meditators who go into a trance and we've understood a lot about how the brain works in deep trance like what um in terms of how your default mode network really shuts down you don't um you are not caught up in self introspection so much you don't think about who am i what am i doing all that and there is complete there's a very lowering of your amygdala there's no sense of threat you go into a sort of almost like a sleep state but awake um where you are almost in harmony so right now if you do an eeg your brain waves are all jagged and that's normal but in your deep sleep you are brain waves are like a wave smooth wave imagine you can reach that at will that's pretty incredible i would want to do those experiments but first i have to get over this cynicism if you enjoyed this clip from the ranveer show we've uploaded a ton of other clips related to a ton of other topics so explore the channel because there's something for everyone